Last week, we started in chapter 3 of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Colossians. It's in chapter 3 where Paul will discuss what a Christian, a true follower of Christ, looks like. Paul reminds them, if then you have been raised with Christ, then you will seek those things that are above. If then you have been raised with Christ, your mind is set on the things that are above, where Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. When were they raised with Christ? He's referring back to chapter 2, verse 12. It was a spiritual resurrection being raised out of the waters of baptism with Christ. Last week, I called their new life a risen life. Just as God had raised Christ from the grave, they were dead in their sins, but God raised them up with Christ. In chapter 3, we will see that they put off the old self and its practices of sin and have become a new creation. It's Christ who will set their conduct, their standard of living. Now, these Colossians were living, raised lives with Christ. I guess it's easy for us to think we are spiritual and godly when we are looking down upon the world. But it's completely different when we are looking up and focusing our minds on the things of God. When I am looking up, I see my shortcomings and my sins. That's when I gain the proper perspective of my life and what God demands. That's when I understand the life changes I need to make for godliness. There are certain things that we must give up things that must be put to death. And these things, I don't want to read them as a list of rules that need to be kept. We need to understand that rule keeping does not change the heart. Strict adherence to the law will not result in a life hidden with Christ in God. Here's a powerful question. What will make me want to obey? Obey God. I will only obey God when my heart is moved and motivated by believing and understanding who Jesus is and the work that Jesus has done. Chapters three and four are not like, are not like chapters one and two. Here in chapter 3, Paul is telling what godliness looks like. Paul did not begin his letter describing how to be godly. Paul began his letter with what Christ has done for you and me. Paul begins by teaching us what makes Jesus so great. When we see who he is and what he has accomplished, Hopefully, there is a response in our hearts leading us to godly actions. Too often, we reverse the pattern. We try to keep the rules, hoping that will change our sinful hearts so that God will do good for us. The message of the gospel is that God has already done good toward us. Therefore, our hearts must be motivated by that goodness. When we see the complete work of Jesus and who he is, that will lead our hearts to change our actions and to kill everything in our lives that is not godly. In chapters 1 and 2, my desire is that you saw why Jesus is so great. Open your Bible, if you will to Colossians chapter 3, and let's look at verses 6 and 7. Colossians 3, verses 6 and 7. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. Notice there's no mincing of words here. Paul says the wrath of God is coming, and God will punish those who practice such activities. What are these activities? Paul's referring to the sins of sexual immorality in verse 5. 
one should not indulge in sexual immorality, even if it's found acceptable under the banner of political correctness as it is today. God's wrath is coming. There are some churches today that proclaim they are inclusive. They include everybody. Their message is that you don't have to change anything in your life. We accept you regardless of the way you live and regardless of what you believe. But that's not what Paul is telling the Colossians. He said, since you were raised with Christ, put to death sexual immorality. Those who engage in such things are wrong, and God will punish them on account of their actions. Paul reminds them that they too had once been guilty of these very things. They considered them as a normal part of their lives, but now they must refuse their body's desire for those things and give them up. So don't be fooled. There will always be people in the world who will apologize for these things. They will try to make these things acceptable, sometimes even trying to make them seem right and good. Don't misunderstand the teaching here. Paul is not promoting celibacy. He's promoting proper sexual conduct. He's telling them not to engage in illicit sexual conduct. Look at verse 8. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. The first group of sins we saw in verse 5 are sexual sins. According to Linsky, who is a Greek scholar and commentator, these sins bring harm and offense to one's own body. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6.18, when you sin sexually, you sin against your own body. But this next group of sins, here in verse 8, they bring harm to other people. Let's look at anger. The boiling of emotions, allowing ourselves to be stirred by negative feelings toward other people. Look at wrath a strong form of the first where the emotions threaten to boil over, the end of control, exasperation. That's wrath. Look at malice or meanness where our unchecked emotions begin to form into some sort of evil action or words. Look at slander, the first and most common mean act is to speak against someone else, to curse them and to speak negatively about them. And then look at obscene talk, possessing a constant attitude of foul, abusive language in regards to other people. By adding verses five and eight together, we get a list of 10 things to resist in the pursuit of holy living. 10 things to give up, 10 things to put to death in order to live a risen life. It's not a comprehensive list of every sin there is, but the fact that Paul refers to sins of sensuality and those of speech show that there are earthly evils that we desire in our hearts. Sexual sins and abusive language come from our imagination. They come out of the heart. The sins we commit are a result of what thoughts are in our hearts. If you are resurrected with Christ, then you have a new heart, which is neither desires these things or produces these things. And it's evident by the way you live your life. Paul says this is what a Christian looks like. The one who's living a risen life in Christ. Personal holiness requires a new approach to personal relationships with other people. That approach is based on truth. 
Look at verse 9. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Paul keeps going back to verse to chapter 2, verse 12. Remember, you're a new creature. You don't practice these sexual sins. You don't practice this kind of speech. You are living a risen life in Christ. Paul says you have a new attitude toward what is true. Paul will return again to that moment. The old man is removed and he's replaced by a new purified holy creation. That moment was baptism. Paul said, because this has happened, you must leave off the sin of lying. Sometimes, sometimes it's difficult to give up the sin of lying because it creeps into so much of what we say and do. If one continues to lie, who do they lie to most? It's usually themselves. Since we have been laid aside the old self, look at verse 10, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. We laid aside the old self and have put on the new self. This transformation was made in order to bring them back to their true and original form. Before sin, Adam was the true image of God. He was sinless and pure, and he knew God. He lost this status because of sin, darkness, separation, and death follow. Paul is saying, now that Christ has renewed man back to his true nature, sinless and having a relationship with God, then it's man's responsibility to be truthful in his relationship to other people. Look at verse 11. Here there is not Greek, and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all in all. Paul summarizes these last few verses. Their standard of living, their risen life in Christ, is not simply a change of ethics. It's not simply a new set of moral rules to follow. It's a complete change that occurs to anyone who experiences the saving power of Jesus Christ. His point is, in this new life, this risen life, one's nationality or race or education or social position is unimportant. Such things mean nothing. Whether a person has Christ is what matters, and Christ is equally available to all. Even if there's a difference in the cultures between Jews and Greeks, no matter. Even if there were differences in your past religion, no matter. Even if there were differences between barbarians and Scythian, civilized or uncivilized, no matter. And then, of course, even if there were differences between slaves and free, no matter. You do not know the truth, and you were lost in your sins. But because of Jesus, you have become a new creature. You have become a Christian, and as a Christian, none of these labels mean anything anymore. Of course, we can identify ourselves. Our ancestors may have come from far across the ocean. We identify with our past, which may explain our accents, our families, traditions, our physical traits, but they have no other meaning than that. Paul says you've been liberated by the truth. The truth can be seen as two great bookends. First, since you were renewed by the truth. So then second, you need to speak the truth. This is where we will stop. Lord willing, we'll begin with verse 12 next week. Uh, thank you for watching.